Welcome to Become a Cybersecurity Ninja, a 10-part webinar series. Today's session, the Ninja Toolkit, 80 Tools in 30 Minutes. By the way, this is session eight of our uh, Become a Ninja series. In two weeks, we'll be doing, well, well, we'll get to that in just a moment. And we are delighted to be joined again by Keith Berner. Up oh, here we go. Our PGQ is underway. So today is your Ninja Toolkit, a review of our favorite tools and services. Not all of these, by the way, are our favorites, but many of them are, and many of them are ones that we've, we've known. And next week, or two weeks from now, we're going to have incident response. Now what? Incident response. I, of course, am Joshua Peske, Vice President of Technology Strategy for Roundtable Technology, and Roundtable provides IT services to nonprofits and small businesses all over the world, but predominantly in New York City and around New York and in Maine where we have most of our personnel and operations. Keith, go ahead and tell us about yourself. Hi, there's a lot to read there, but basically I am your classic accidental techie become director of IT. My own background is in international relations, which is where Freedom House is focused. And really what I do is I leverage others' expertise. That is, I am not the expert in anything. <laughs> And as you're noticing, we are doing Pizza Kucha. We're not going to do this for the whole webinar today, but for the first 20 slides, the slides will be auto advancing every 20 seconds. Uh, you'll also see these parenthetical J and K. Those are just for me and Keith to know which slides for which we are responsible. And uh, once this starts going, we are every 20 seconds, the slides are auto advancing. We thought this would add a little bit of fun to an otherwise perhaps dry webinar of presenting a bunch of tools. So hopefully you'll agree with us. At least it adds stress for us. Exactly. Stress for us, if nothing else. But we didn't go for the whole thing. Our learning objectives today, we're going to give you actually quite a bit more than 80 resources. If anyone actually wants to count how many resources, I, I lost count, I think around 85. How to research your tools, the limits of researching your tools. You're going to experience a Picha Kucha style presentation, 20 slides, 20 seconds, and further reading and resources, of course. All right, some cautions. First of all, there are very few good sources that objectively analyze these tools. Also, know that there's no guarantee that any tool will give you the security you need. Remember that the very best tool technically may not do you any good if nobody uses it. And finally, use tools properly. So the next set of things we're gonna talk about are ways to browse securely and also to search securely on the web. We've got uh, a couple of uh, different areas coming up here, and this is one of those cases where I'm just talking to fill the 20 seconds until the next slide <laughs> magically comes up. And there it is, and it's me, and I'm gonna talk about Tor, your anonymous browser. So it is a free open source browser for all platforms, and it gives you anonymous browsing. Again, you need to install it and use it correctly. They provide excellent instructions for doing so, and it will allow you to have a mostly anonymous browsing experience. In my, in my professional life, Google is not my enemy. In my personal life, it is. I use DuckDuckGo or StartPage to do all my internet searching. Neither of these sends any data back to Google, and I have found that the quality of the search results is just as good as Google. So, um, Privacy Badger, this is another browsing tool from the Electronic Frontier Foundation. You'll see them mentioned an awful lot today, and it blocks spying ads and invisible trackers from your browser. Free add-on for Firefox or Chrome, and very, very highly recommended. It doesn't impact your browsing experience very much at all, in my experience. And also from the Electronic Frontier Foundation, HTTPS everywhere. This forces all sites onto encrypted connections, so you, the, the, their you know, slogan is encrypt the web, and also a free plugin for Firefox, Chrome, and Opera, and recommend using that as well. And again, doesn't impact your browsing experience too much. There is no such thing as a definitive list of which are the best VPNs. The site that we're showing you here is the best that exists out there. But basically, if you want the most secure VPN, roll your own. This site, on the other hand, does a good job of analyzing existing commercial VPN services across a wide range of criteria. Password managers or vaults, you cannot possibly create complex passwords, memorize them, change them on a regular basis, which is where the next set of tools comes in. These are encrypted uh, 
password vaults that also include random password generators. The one I like the best is LastPass. It's free except for on an enterprise level. We use it here at Freedom House and it includes, as I said, both the vault itself and a random password generator. So the only passwords you need to remember in your life is the one for your password vault. By the way, don't lose your master password or you will lose your data. KeyPass is also highly respected. Difference is it stores the data locally, which you could consider safer than storing it in the web. On the other hand, if it's stored on your hard drive, you better be backing up that file or you could lose all your passwords. One password is one that I've been using in my personal life for quite a long time. Frankly, after having used LastPass and 1Password, I don't see any reason to pay the money for 1Password because LastPass is really just as good. But this is generally, these three that we just did are generally listed among the best password vaults by most uh, observers. Some key success for password managers, make sure, of course, you have a strong master password. If it supports two-factor authentication, that's even better, and I would definitely recommend using that. If you're implementing this to your organization, provide lots of support and change management to your staff. Allow time for effective adoption. Two-factor authentication. Here's the thing. If somebody hacks your password, but there's a second factor required for you to get for somebody to get into your account, they can't do it unless they have that second factor. This is an essential security tool for organizations and for individuals. Authy. Authy is a nice uh, two-factor authentication that you can use to add two-factor authentication to multiple applications. It's one of the leaders in this space. A lot of different options for use of Authy, very inexpensive to implement for your organization. Duo is the one we use here at Freedom House. It came has come recommended by a number of security experts. Note that um, it can be used across a variety of applications. In our pricing comparisons, it has uh, shown itself to be more inexpensive or less expensive than some other tools, and it incl includes a phishing testing module. And YubiKey is a different form of two-factor authentication that uses a physical key that plugs into a USB slot or uses uh, wireless in, uh, encryption to authenticate you to a device, and that is an incredibly secure mode of two-factor authentication. Next, for folks where, who need to have private phone calls, we're going to talk about a couple of options for voice conversations. Note, of course, the other person has to have the same tool you do for that voice conversation to be encrypted. First one we're going to talk about, I would say, is the gold standard among both voice and messaging encryption. We'll talk about it later as messaging is Signal by Open Whisper Systems. This is a free service. Again, you, as Keith mentioned, the other person has to have it as well. You have to have the other person's signal number, which will not be the same as their regular phone number, and then you can have an encrypted conversation. Silent Phone by Silent Circle is also well respected. One thing to note about it is that there is an optional feature that allows communication with any mobile or landline. Note also that the full burn functionality means you can set expiration timing for messages sent and received. Keith, we did it! We did it. I, I am now, I, you know, I'm ready to uh, pop open a beverage right now. <laughs> That was, you know, I actually really enjoyed that quite a bit. I, 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 I would highly recommend doing that more. I, I, I did too, and I just hope that our audience didn't have their eyes glaze over by too much information at once. It was very fast. So we decided, we, we did a run through yesterday just for the audience, and we decided that it would not be in the best interest of everybody here to do the Pichu Kucha style for the entire presentation. So hopefully everybody is now seeing a blue slide called messaging, Keith or Ben, if you can verify that. I've yes. uh, switched over to the other screen. We're going to advance this manually, kind of the old-fashioned way from here on out. We're going to continue to move at a pretty brisk pace, but we now can sort of stop for questions. We're not, we may, we can stay less for 20 seconds on a slide, more for 20 seconds on a slide, but we're going to continue moving at a brisk pace because we want to get through all these tools. All right, so messaging, we just talked about Signal. So Signal also works for 
private encrypted messaging. Still free. Again, you'll have a private signal number. Someone else uh, also needs to be on signal for that to be encrypted. And it's an extraordinarily secure thing. Another uh, point that we, we, while we're on the PCQ chain, I'm just going to say this applies to all of these things and security in general. None of these things are going to be secure if you don't use them correctly. And so the, the ultimate caution I have for all of these tools is, the, you know, if you're not going to use them in a proper way on a system itself that is secure, then there's obviously no guarantee of security with these systems. So, but that said, Signal, very, very highly regarded as an encrypted private messaging system. Now, I'll note just uh, uh, kind of still talking about Signal. If it were up to me, there wouldn't be any other messaging app that I would use. But here's a problem. If the people you're communicating with are used to a different app, that's the one you've got to use to communicate with them. So even though I can highly recommend Signal, if you're dealing with a bunch of activists on the ground and that whole activist community is using WhatsApp, well, that's what you're going to have to use. WhatsApp has been highly respected, um, but Facebook bought it recently. One thing is you have to set your uh, Facebook, I guess, preferences so that you are not automatically sharing the data back with Facebook. Um, the other thing is that very recently it came out that a backdoor allows Facebook to see the data in any case. The danger there is not that Facebook is actually mining your WhatsApp communication, but that in a hostile environment, if a government issues a subpoena to them, if they can access the data, they will have to turn it over. That, by the way, that flaw is not in Signal. All right, onwards. Oops, this one does not have anyone assigned to it. Keith, you want to take this one? I will. I'll take this one away. Telegram is very, very popular. Here's the hazard. In normal mode, it is not encrypted. You have to manually turn on its secret messaging um, uh, add-on, and the other person has to respond to it for your communication to be encrypted. Also, that secret message functionality doesn't exist in every platform. So I recommend against using Telegram because of the likelihood that you will forget or won't be able to set the encryption. Pigeon is really a very simple chat tool for the desktop. The other apps that we were talking about were primarily intended for mobile, though some of them and some of the ones we're going to talk about also have components that will work from the desktop. Hey, I'm still on. How about that? Perio is a little more, has a little more functionality than the other messaging tools in that it also includes file storage and sharing. Um, this is, while not as widely reviewed and respected as Signal, it also has been peer reviewed and is indeed respected. So it's worth giving a try. I'm still no on. Escape, Keith. Yeah, there's no escape. Oh no man, I'm glad we're I'm glad we're not still on the uh, 22nd <laughs> auto advance. So, um, Wicker, frankly, I cannot find um, any peer reviews of it. People who use it like it a lot. It's got some very nice functionality, and again, worth a try. Though I'm not sure if I were dealing with the most dangerous environments, whether it would be my first choice if I could use Signal. I will say the email key sharing, though, is a useful feature in terms of verifying who you're talking to. Still That's unique. right. Yep. Wire, I would put in the same category as Wicker. It's got some great functionality. Um, and note that it doesn't store conversations at all. That's something that is not true of all the other ones. And I do want to ask uh, the audience, by the way, if you have any tools or services that are in the category that we're talking about and you want to throw those in here, or if you've used one of the, things, the tools that we're talking about and have something to say about it, by all means, throw that into the, uh, the questions box. And now we're going to talk about email encryption. First thing we're going to talk about is the GNU Privacy Guard. Or I was deeply confused by this, by the way, because I'm familiar, much more familiar with PGP, which is pretty good privacy, and I assume this was a typo. I actually hadn't heard of the GPG suite, but it is a uh, GNU privacy guard. It actually uses uh, public private key encryption just like PGP and provides a whole suite of tools for Macs and for, for OS X and for Windows that you can use to encrypt email. So very, very good platform and you know free. 
and a bit complex to impl implement, I would say would be the big uh, downside of that one. It, I actually want to want to add to that if I can real quick, and that please. is, a, if you know the tools to install, it's not hard to install them. The hard thing is training end users, right. uh, including perhaps activists on the ground whom you've never met, to use the sharing of public public keys with a private key in the background. Um, this is not something that is highly intuitive to people who are not who are not technical, and that's the biggest hurdle for using this approach. The other thing I would just say real quickly: the better known PGP is a semantic tool and is many thousands of dollars. Yep. Yeah. The, this GPG is the free open source millennial version <laughs> with, yeah. with lots of lots of use, but not a lot of. Um, walkthroughs and in guides <laughs> so gotcha. it's an edward snowden tool as opposed to a you know joshua Matt, Biscay tool yeah, corporate tool. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, mail will uh, open I'm gonna go ahead and say i resent that Matt. <laughs> Mailvelope is really the same principle as GPG, except that it works in web-based mode as opposed to working in a desktop client. But there again, your users are going to have to know how and be comfortable with uh, creating and sharing keys. Virtru is I think the best tool for the money out there, I'll let the others here disagree with me if they care to when their slides come up. Um, Virtru is what we're using at Freedom House, except in our most highly sensitive cases that really need the GPG level of encryption. Um, Virtru includes functionality for expiring the messages you send, for preventing uh, um, forwarding of the messages, and also allows you to revoke permissions once you've given them. Um, they have discounted pricing for nonprofits, and they work both for commercial webmail, they also work in Outlook for Mac and PC, and they are just now developing, and it's in beta, a client that works in your web browser with Outlook web access. Um, note that they have no plans ever to make this work with Mac mail because Mac doesn't play nice in the, mail in the uh, sandbox, sorry. And for users, it is brain dead simple to use, which means they will use it. And you'll get no uh, arguments from me about it being, I would say, the most user friendly and still secure option of, of all of these. And again, it being used correctly by people is something that, you know, virtue, even if it's not as rock solid secure as, let's say, the new uh, privacy guard, if, it, if it's used correctly versus being used you know, uh, GPG being used incorrectly, it's going to be more secure. And that's, that's sounds like a just playing semantics, but that's really important when you're thinking about, you know, the real world. And whether it's crypt up is what I use, crypt up because uh, that works with my Gmail client. I do have to set up a PGP public private key pair, but once you've got that, you can use crypt up and that works very well. You can also, with crypt up, uh, use a one-time pass key so I can create a password for an encrypted message and then I can call the person and give them that password over the phone or via some other method so it, you can communicate by encryption with people who don't have this as well. Office 365 includes an encryption feature. It's included in the E3 level and above. A lot of nonprofits are on E1 Office 365 because it's free. If you want to add the encryption feature, it's $2 a month, which also then includes some other Azure um, security features. Note that unlike a tool like Virtru, you can encrypt the message but you can't do things like set an expiration, prevent forwarding, or revoke privileges. It is also extremely simple to use. In our case, I set it up to basically read a tag in the subject line. If you type bracket, encrypted, close bracket, your message is encrypted. You can configure it so that it would encrypt based on who's sending it, who's receiving it, contents of the subject line, or a variety of other features. And just to be clear, that's two dollars per month per account that you have. So if you have ten that's accounts, right. it actually be twenty dollars right. a month. That's right. And you don't. So, for example, we have 180 users. I haven't purchased it for all of them. I've purchased it for the 20 who want to use it. Exactly. Um, Hushmail. It is. Um, it is 
sort of hazardous to use. If you're writing to other hush mail, uh, uh, people who have hush mail, it's automatically encrypted. But if you're sending to somebody who doesn't have hush mail, the way you encrypt it is by creating a secret question and answer. Now, if the answer that you've created is too simple, then it's like using a simple password for anything else. Uh, so if the answer to whatever question I posed is 1973, well, that's only four characters and they're all numbers, right? Um, also note that the free account, you must use the Hushmail domain. And if you don't use it frequently, your account expires. You cannot resurrect it with the same email address. If you want to use it again for free, you'd have to create a new Hushmail username to continue using it. And we have one that's unassigned. I actually don't know a ton about Proton Mail. Keith, do you want to take this one on? I have not used it myself. Um, I do know other people who use it and like it. Uh, I think it's particularly for nonprofits. You, I think you can get a better rate from Virtru. Why bother with using this unless you're happy using the Proton Mail domain? Yeah, and I think where I've seen this as a use case is people who just don't want to be on Microsoft or, or Google at all. So where this is different from the other folks, it's not encrypting mm -hmm. the message that you're using from some other provider. This actually will host your mail. So Proton Mail is a you know can host your web mail, and then you're doing it through Proton Mail, and you're not on Google or Microsoft platform. And if that's that appeals to an organization, that's uh, something you might want to look at. Keith, uh, want to take this one? Yeah, Tutanota fits really, it's it's similar in functionality and purpose um, to the previous one. Um, I do know people who use it and like it. And By the way, I will say for, oh, say for that one, the one euro a month cost for using your own domain is cheaper than for ProtonMail. And just be aware, especially as we get through these uh, rest slides, some of these we're just going to show very, very quickly because we assume that you're familiar with a lot of these tools, but we just wanted to make sure that you knew that some of them were encrypted. You might not have realized that. Uh, first, we're going to talk about file deletion and wiping. So if you want to clean a computer and make sure that the files that you've deleted off that machine are not recoverable through a forensic tool or something like that, CC Cleaner and Eraser are both tools that you can use to have make it harder for forensic people or basic you know IT folks to use undelete programs to recover things from your computer. Veracrypt is um, kind of the follow-on to TrueCrypt, which stopped being supported, I guess, a year and a half ago. By the way, TrueCrypt still does work, um, but I'd rather use Veracrypt because it's continuing to be developed. Um, it can be, be used for whole disk encryption or to create encrypted containers that you store any number of files in. I will note that the whole disk encryption is a little problematic in that there's about a 20 to 30 second delay between entering your password and the whole disk actually unencrypting. Oops. Um, Anybody here who uses Mac and isn't aware of the built-in uh, whole disk encryption um, should go back and relearn how to use Mac. Since Windows 7 Enterprise and Windows 10, BitLocker is included, um, which is really the best tool for, for whole disk encryption on Windows. And on both uh, Macs and Windows, these are really just toggle switches that you'll find to just turn on encryption for the disk, and that's, that's pretty much all you have to do. Vaultive is like Virtru for Gmail and, and Office 365. It allows you to take files, store them in the cloud, in Dropbox, in Box.org, in OneDrive, in Google Drive, and have those files encrypted uh, both if in transit and at rest. So meaning when you're transferring the file from Google Drive to open on your computer, that whole session is encrypted. And when it's sitting on Google Drive or on Box, it's encrypted. So if someone were able to get to it, they would only get the encrypted data. So we'll add on and, tool. And Go do ahead. I recall you're saying, Joshua, that that's a, that the pricing is reasonable there? I don't remember. The checking pricing is that. reasonable there. And the main use case there would be for what's called blind subpoenas, which we've talked about in previous webinars. I'll talk about that a little bit now. All the, the major platforms, so Box, Dropbox, Google Drive and OneDrive, which I just proved, all of these actually do encrypt the files. Most of us, I think, are probably not aware of that, but the files are encrypted. But they're encrypted via those companies. And a blind subpoena where the government 
says, I'd like to take a look at, you know, the data that Joshua has in Google Drive, and I'd like you, Google, to hand it over and not tell Josh about it. If it's encrypted just in the Google Drive encryption, then Google can decrypt it and hand it over. If I use something like Vaultive or a different third-party tool to encrypt it, then Google Drive can hand it over, but they're handing over encrypted data. The government would then say, hey, you know, we need this decrypted, and they'd say, you're going to have to talk to Joshua because we don't have the key. And that's the, the big difference there. But the data is, for the most part, encrypted from non-government entities who would try to steal that data from you. Vera is another sort of add-on tool that you can use to, like Vaultive, essentially add uh, different encryptions uh, that to, to those cloud platforms. So that's another tool you can use. We have that duplicated. And we're going to talk a little bit about fish testing. Uh, Keith, I don't know if you want to, well, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, so no. Wombat, oh, go ahead. I was going to say, actually, that I would have uh, – Joshua and I are having a little marital squabble here. I would have named this section uh, sec security training. Fish testing is one component of it. Well, we could but, do that really quickly. So let, let ah, you want to rename it right to, now? Yeah, sure. Why not? Watch yeah. this, audience. You're watching things Look happen as we speak. Yeah, why not? There you go. All right. See? Ask and you should receive. There's no need for us to fight, Keith. Not in front oh, of the good. kids. All right, <laughs> Wombat security, security awareness training programs, what these do is they send phishing emails to your staff, and if your staff are false for the phishing email, if they click on the link or open the attachment or you know, uh, respond to the email with the requested information, then they will be notified that, hey, this is, you know, you, you were compromised by this fish. They'll route you usually to a short, like five minute video or some training resource that'll explain, here's what you fell for, here's how to recognize that sort of thing in the future. And then you will get lots of good data about which, you know, how many of your staff are falling for these things. Keith? No before is what we use at Freedom House. Uh, know before features a pretty wide set of training videos um, depending on what level of the service you subscribe to you get more or fewer of those videos available for your end users by the way we make those required for all incoming staff know before also includes a phishing testing module with a number of uh, i mean a large number of pre-set up templates also the ability to create your own templates by the way the way I use this tool is that when I get the the report back about who's clicking on those phishing emails, there's never punishment. What they get back from me is a marked up copy of the email that they fell for, along with guidance about the clues they should have looked for. And so what we're doing is increasing everybody's awareness over time and never making them feel punished for making a mistake. Super important point to make. And I wish to let everybody know now in the spirit of full disclosure, we are not going to make 80 tools in 30 minutes, probably 80 tools in 35 to 40 minutes. <laughs> we're, we're almost at 2.30. We got about, I think, 10 or 15 slides to go. We're going to keep it brisk, though, keep it moving. Another of these is SANS, Secure the Human. Uh, there's three that we basically said, which we consider the three leaders in the space, which are No Before, Wombat Security, SANS, Secure the Human. I would say that uh, my experience of is consistent with keys. I find no before very easy to use. It's also significantly less expensive than the other two, especially at the lower ends of the spectrum. So that's uh, just our little feedback on that. Orders of magnitude cheaper, I would say. I just got quotes from all three of them. If you actually want a secure device, secure mobile phone, then we have the Black Phone by Silent Service. A, a, these are a bit on the pricey side, but these are essentially encrypted phones or crypto phones that you can use for secure communications and you distribute these among the people that need to communicate securely. Una OS. Uh, I don't know much about this one. Do you want to tell me about this one, Keith? Yeah, I've had some conversations with the folks who are developing it. First of all, it's in crowdfunding stage. It's not out yet. Their main um, comparison to the previous one is that they're not using and they're not using Google apps. They're installing their own apps on it, even though the code is Android based. So the previous one does send data to Google. Google. This one doesn't. Also, their prospective price point for it is two hundred dollars lower uh, than the previous one. Great. And I, had, I we did this in uh, one, I think, two webinars ago. But the Faraday bag is something you can carry around. You can put your phone in it, and then your phone won't communicate with anything. If you just want to be secure for that moment, you're at a protest or somewhere where you'd rather your phone not be communicating, but you have it with you, you can, of course, turn it off. But if that, even that doesn't make you totally secure, a Faraday bag, something you can add. 
podcasts. I'll talk about these because because I think Keith, you said you weren't. Um, these are the ones. That, yeah, <laughs> these are the ones I've been uh, over the last year running through. You know, the top. You know, all the top ten, top twenty lists of security podcasts. These are the two that I listen to every pretty much every week when they come out. Risky Biz, I really enjoy it. The guys are funny. They're entertaining. It's much more for enterprise level cybersecurity. So a lot of the stuff will probably go over most of our heads. Certainly, a lot of it goes over mine. But a lot of it is super accessible, and like I said, they're pretty fun and, and interesting. And Unsupervised Learning by Daniel Meisler, he also releases the newsletter. This is, in terms of the content, there is nothing that even comes close what, to what he does every week. He gives you a kind of rundown of a bunch of cybersecurity stuff every week, along with some other interesting things. He does that in about you know 45 minutes. He also releases the newsletter. It's a repeat of the same thing. His delivery is very dry, so bear with it, but the content is unbelievable. And if you want more podcasts to look at, uh, we have these two links here for some other podcasts that you can look at. Resource list. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation, that would be the gold standard for security tools, security news. What, you know, what are the best practices if you need to communicate private, privately with other people and you need to keep your communications? They really are, I would say, the gold standard. I'll add just one other thing there. They yeah. also a advocate for things like net neutrality and privacy. And so if you're looking for a great place to contribute a little of your annual money that you give away, EFF really deserves it. Keith, Digital Defenders, you want to say anything about them? Um, Digital Defenders has a variety of tools online, including that first aid kit, and I'm going to leave it at that. All right, Tactical Technology Collective, they have a ton of great resources that you can do, and they provide a lot of good security trainings, a lot of good security uh, handouts and things like that. Another very good resource, uh, not quite at the level of EFF, but a lot of great stuff that they put out. Passcode, so sadly, I loved Passcode, and it went under. It was a production of the Christian Science Monitor. They ran it like a three-year thing. This was my favorite thing that they ever did, which was 15 under 15. It's 15 stories of 15 kids under the age of 15 doing cybersecurity work, and uh, I highly recommend checking out. All their stuff, is, their historical stuff is still online. They just stopped producing new stuff, but that 15 under 15 was just great, and everything Pasco did was great, and I'm so sad that they're not here anymore. Keith, you want to talk about that one? Yeah, Do Not Track is a series of webinars or web broadcasts um, that are high quality and cover really the whole gamut of security issues. Krebs on security, probably the most well-known. Um, I don't know, the, the Security Now podcast would probably be the number one thing, it's certainly in the, in the podcast store. But Krebs on security, uh, he was a Washington Post reporter. He started a security blog, and he does regularly as a newsletter. His website has, has current affairs and lots of great stuff there. Uh, also good resource. ZDNet, uh, if you're in a little more in the commercial space, they have a, a blog essentially called Zero Day where they keep I think that's just a screenshot of their their post today but it's pretty good stuff there actually uh, it's not bad stuff yet more here we go uh, something that we produced that uh, Access Now created this uh, digital persona digital security persona uh, and we have a link to that at the bottom of this of this uh, persona template here this is a tool that we've been using in our cybersecurity projects we found incredibly helpful also find this helpful as like a policy tool instead of having like an eight page policy that no one will read this can be like your, you know, bring your own device policy. You can actually make a template, give that out to your staff. And we include a blank one here, so you can make your own. So go have fun with that. All these additional resources here, we have all the specifics from Electronic Frontier Foundation, Spell and Self-Defense, Who Has Your Back, Digital Security Protesters, uh, the Digital Security How-To from Access Now, that's where that persona guide came from. Uh, personal Security Course from Community Red, and just a bunch of other things. Getting a note from Keith that he can't hear me. Did my audio cut out? Hello, hello. Let me check I can my hear. audio. Ben can hear. Okay, so Keith, I think maybe your audio went out. Uh, and a bunch of other stuff there. I'm not going to run through all of these, but I think we're okay. And then, of course, ninja.rtt.nyc, all of the webinars we have done as part of this series are resources. And what's next? So we finished only five minutes long. That's not too bad. And we are going to be doing now what? Incident response planning in two weeks. And then after that, all you have is on May 30th, your quiz. 
to see if you can get your ninja certificate. I'm very much looking forward to that. The whole session will be your cybersecurity quiz and uh, studying will just be reviewing the previous webinars if you want to study. And there'll be prizes and there'll be all that good stuff. And we've lost Keith. Um, so I think Keith is going to try and reconnect. But fortunately, he made it through almost the whole session. And maybe he'll be back in, but we are open for Q&A. And thank you, everybody, for staying in. That was your 80 tools plus in 35 minutes and plus a little peachy kucha so you get a feel for what that was like. And I think we're all set. So if anyone has any questions, go ahead and throw them in. Otherwise, I think we will wrap. I'll give it just a minute or so and see if anyone has anything. Ben, do you have any tools or any comments or anything you want to share about any of that? Uh, no, I mean, I, I just wanted to make sure that you mentioned security now, but you got to it right at the end there. Kind of yeah, <laughs> I didn't back you in mentioning it. <laughs> Not one that I actually listen to. Do you actually listen to Security Now? Every I week do. Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so it's been on for like about it. tw it's been on for almost twelve years. Um, yeah. So there's plenty of back catalog. Uh, and it's Leonard this... Lopate. Uh, Leonard, um, not not Lopate. Um, what's his name? Leonard. Who's the guy who does? Leo Laporte. That's right. It's yes, Leo Laporte. Yeah, Leo Laporte. Uh, uh, hosts. I'm. <laughs> I am back and can hear Great. you guys now. Great. With, Great. Uh, Welcome to you. Yeah. With Steve Gibson as the co-host. All right. I think actually it's probably reversed. Uh, Steve does most of the talking. He's the security oh, expert. Okay. He's the, <laughs> the guy who asks the most it's of the questions. The guy. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. But you still like that one. Okay. I do. Yep. Yeah. And it's a weekly. Uh, they do alternating Q&As every other week. So, you know, if you have questions or whatever, uh, you, can, you can always. And how long is the Security Now podcast? Uh, it can it can take some time, and uh, I think the Q and A episodes are usually about two hours, um, oh, wow. and the yeah. the other yeah, episodes are usually quite a bit longer, or can be quite a bit longer because he's talking about different um, topics and things like that. So, but he usually picks a topic that's in the current news cycle, so it you know it has relevance uh, in the short term, but also in the long term. So um, I, want I found it very useful. We do have a really good question here from, from Michael, uh, who asked a question about Signal, which is, has Signal been compromised? And I do want to respond to this question because this comes up a lot, and this is a real problem with the media, and they're trying to support on cybersecurity things generally. So the WikiLeaks dump, uh, the shadow brokers leaks about all the, the NSA and CIA tools that they used and the methodologies that they used, uh, a lot of the media reported that Signal was among the things that were compromise that the, that the NSA or the CIA had been able to, to crack, so to speak. And I just want to clarify exactly what was meant there and also clarify that Signal itself was not breached or cracked in any way, and there's no indication that it has been. However, and again, this was a point we made at the beginning of the webinar, the way that these tools are implemented ultimately is going to determine the security of them. If I am running Signal on my mobile phone and my mobile phone is compromised, is, you know, in, in hacker parlance, owned by the CIA because the CIA has been able to get malicious code on it and they can see and record everything that's going on on my phone, then everything I'm doing in Signal is being revealed. It doesn't mean that Signal's been compromised. It means that my phone has been compromised. So I have to ensure that the device that I am using, you know, signal on is, uh, Keith, we got really loud breathing on your side again, sorry. Um, that the device on which I am using these encryption tools, that the device itself is secure and the person with whom I'm communicating, that their device is secure. And this is why security is, in effect, really hard. But signal itself was not compromised, but they had tools that could allow them to own somebody's phone and then if that phone had signal on it and the person was using signal, then of course they'd be able to see what that person was doing in signal. So that's the answer there. And great question. And hopefully I was able to clarify that. And that I also type, I typed in a couple of answers there as well. Oh, thank you, Keith. And I think that is it. Keith, thank you so much for joining us. It was so great having you back. Thanks for all the, the tools. And everything, by the way, I want to give Keith credit. A lot of the tools in there were from his great resource, which I listed on the second to last resource page. So uh, if we go back to slides here, just so everyone knows, uh, the last of these tools, second to last, comprehensive list of security tools and resources. There is the entire list from Keith Berner. So there's a link there. And, and that's where a lot of these things came, came from today. So Keith, thank you so much for that. And thank you all for joining us. And we'll see you back here in two weeks. Bye all.